1976, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act was signed into law. And an amazing 12 years later, the Native Hawaiian Health Care Improvement Act was signed into law. Today we have two people who were and have been integrally and continue to be integrally involved in Indian health care and Native Hawaiian health care. Joanne Kaufman, who's the president and CEO of Kaufman and Associates, who's been had a lifelong involvement in Indian health care, and Hardy Spore, the former director of Papa Ola Lakahi, the Native Hawaiian health care system that oversees the Native Hawaiian health care clinics. I'd like to ask them both to come aboard, and our moderator for this panel is Andrew Lee, Vice President of the Aetna Corporation and a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Museum of the American Indian. Andrew? Thank you, Patricia. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to say a few words about this session, where we hope you'll get a clear sense of both the challenges and the opportunities we have as Native people when it comes to health. And the core message we want to leave with you is this. When it comes to Native health, we've made some meaningful progress against long odds. Our work is not done. And probably most importantly, we can do it. Senator Noe was passionate about many things, as we've heard throughout the day, and health care was one of them. He recognized that indigenous people cannot achieve their individual and collective dreams if they're not physically and mentally well. Yet for most of the 20th century through today, the state of Native health has been largely disappointing. Chronic disease in kids as young as seven or eight years old. Pervasive addiction with an absence of treatment options. Outdated or mismanaged health clinics that have long-standing shortages of medical professionals. These conditions are shameful. At the same time, however, a growing number of Native communities are making progress. They're saying enough is enough, and they're taking the bull by the horns by taking over their health care centers, employing traditional medicine, and investing in prevention. As the Senator knew better than almost anyone, when it comes to improving Native health, self-determination is not only the right approach, it works. Senator Noe was also passionate about health and health care because of his personal experiences as a patient. Like so many of his fellow servicemen, Senator Noe was wounded in combat and spent many years in hospitals in Europe and the United States. As a patient, he developed an unwavering commitment to improving the system and held a special fondness for the profession of nursing. His personal experience with healthcare systems, coupled with his dedication to indigenous peoples, made Senator Inouye a uniquely effective champion for Native health. Whether it was fighting for mental health services or calling on the government to address the health needs of urban Indians and just transforming the system overall. For that, we remain most grateful. The session this afternoon comes at an important time. The US healthcare system is in a period of transformation, and the changes we're making today will have an impact on the health and wellness of Native communities seven generations from today. There are more questions than there are certainties. Will our system shift its orientation from treating sickness to one that promotes health and wellness? Can we spend our health care dollars more wisely? Will we, as people, get control of the epidemic of chronic disease that cuts short way too many dreams? For Native communities, the stakes couldn't be any higher. So it's a perfect time 
to explore how we can build upon the foundation of self-determination that Senator Inouye and others strengthened for our people. Any student of Indian Affairs knows that we have a tough hill to climb. But I also know that Native people can achieve incredible things in spite of the long odds. If my travels throughout Indian country have taught me anything at all, it's that we have many, many reasons to be optimistic. With that context, it's now my pleasure to introduce our first of two speakers on health this afternoon. Our first speaker is Joanne Kaufman, who's a citizen of the Nez Perce tribe. Joanne's had more than three decades of experience working both on reservation and in urban Indian health issues. She's the founder and current CEO of Kaufman & Associates, a consulting firm that specializes in public health. Joanne's worked closely with the tribes, the Indian Health Service, and new, numerous Indian, urban Indian health programs, including serving as the executive director of the Seattle Indian Health Board. She played a critical role in the reauthorization of the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, and she's known widely for her leadership and community advocacy. On a more personal note, Joanne comes from a big family, and she grew up in Seattle and the Nez Perce Reservation in Idaho. She holds a Master of Public Health degree from UC Berkeley, and she's a trustee of Eastern Washington University. And although she doesn't look nearly old enough, Joanne's a recent grandmother to a one-year-old grandson named Patrick. And when she's not working, she remains very active and loves to run. Joanne. Except this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my friends, it's just, this has been an incredible day, first of all. Thank you to all of the uh, people who have uh, testified about the wonderful work of Senator Inouye. I've just, I've, I've enjoyed every single minute of it. One of the things that I, I wanted to mention that um, I hadn't heard yet today uh, was to put things into a little bit of context in 1987. Uh, for those of you that remember 1987, uh, America had just finished listening uh, to a series of hearings uh, on the Iran-Contra um, scandal, I guess, that had just been um, un unleashed and, and unveiled. And Americans had been glued to their television sets watching a very uh, somber, uh, intelligent, uh, organized uh, uh, judge and, and convener and chairperson uh, in the form of Senator uh, Daniel Inouye and uh, working through the list of witnesses and, and plowing through very complicated information. He went uh, from all of our television sets in this very important hearing process uh, to being introduced as the new chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. And I just want you to just kind of take a moment here to, to remember that context of seeing probably the most uh, powerful person um, in the Senate at that time coming forward as our new chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. It was, it was, it was unbelievable and it was wonderful and it was, it was, it was humbling. Um, when he uh, talked about Indian health, one of the things that he used to enjoy saying was that the um, American Indian people paid dearly in the form of uh, mil hundreds of millions of acres of land uh, for certain things and certain guarantees, one of which is health care. And that, in a sense, the Indian health delivery system in America today was America's first prepaid health plan. So he understood very deeply the, the uh, relationship that existed, the historical relationship, the underpinnings of this Indian health delivery system um, that became, uh, eventually became the Indian Health Service. Um, American Indian Health has had uh, yeah, a tragic uh, history going from, go, going from uh, a state of, of wellness and harmony and balance to the, uh, the uh, um, disruption of uh, colonization and Indian wars um, and uh, dislocation and relocation. And it began to uh, improve. There are some critical milestones in 19, 
1955 when the Indian Health Service was established and the function of Indian Health was moved from the BIA over to the Public Health Service, statistics were began, began to be kept at that time. And you can begin to track the improvements in uh, infant mortality and maternal health, and you can actually see the significant improvement in health care, but also health systems like um, sanitation systems and, and, wa and clean water systems. And then, as was mentioned earlier, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act in 1976, which substantially expanded and um, delineated the functions in more detail for the Indian health system and, and actually uh, riding with the Indian Self-Determination Act, the opportunity to transfer the role of administering and managing and directing these health services from a centralized federal system to a tribally based and tribally controlled system. The next big, um, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, of course, stands alone, I think, and, and it, has, it has developed over time, but the impact of Senator uh, Inouye, I think, can be tracked and measured uh, in metrics um, during his time, during his tenure on the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Um, for him, I hope this goes the correct way. For him, the, the Indian health was very personal. He carried, cared very deeply about the individuals that he saw in the clinics and the hospitals uh, that he visited. Uh, he, because, as was uh, Lee described, his uh, relationship with the health providers when he was hospitalized uh, with his injuries from World War II, uh, he understood the delicate balance uh, of our lives, of our, of our physical bodies, and the, and the compassion uh, that it takes for people to work uh, to restore our health. He often cited in hearings and, and speeches uh, as he traveled to um, clinics like the Seattle Indian Health Board, specific examples that he's heard over, over his travels, like waiting lists for people to, to get in and have their teeth uh, taken care of that might uh, go from six months up to a year or longer, of individuals who could not get uh, health care for something that was very obviously in need of, of, of some surgery because of a rule about um, contract health services being restricted only for life and limb emergencies. Um, he, he often talked about the sanitation uh, challenges for many Alaska Native villages that did not have the uh, sanitary uh, water sewer systems and relied on honey buckets. And he often talked about a x-ray machine that he saw in the Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma Urban Indian Clinic that the likes of which he said he had not seen since World War II. The funding for uh, Indian Health, um, I, th I believe, is, the, is the, one of the big uh, contributions that Senator Inouye made. Um, oops. As chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, he was able, and a member of the Appropriations Committee, he was able to influence the process for increasing uh, funding for Indian Health across the board, um, but he specifically set out that task um, to, to grow the Indian Health Service um, through uh, uh, seeking and, and securing an ex officio um, participation on the Interior Appropriations Committee. Uh, he pledged to increase in 1990 Indian Health by a billion dollars, and he came close to doing that. And over the, his tenure, he tripled the Indian Health Service budget from about 700, 700 million to over $3 billion. Um, he also used his ability uh, to leverage resources for Indian health care from other resources, including his position with the Department of Defense. He went on a, um, a tour overseas um, with uh, several Indian health um, representatives to look at the proposed military facilities uh, that were on the mothball list um, and to look at their health care uh, delivery systems and to see what, if any, of the equipment or resources might be able to be repurposed to, into the Indian Health Service system. Uh, he was proud to point out that the Tulsa Urban Indian Clinic um, was able to get rid of their ancient x-ray machine and take advantage of one of the new x-ray uh, modern uh, pieces of equipment from the uh, Department of Defense um, decommissioning process. 
He was also very um, influential in terms of other aspects of Indian health care outside of the Indian Health Service and Im impacting um, increases in funding for a variety of other programs in labor, HS, labor uh, HHS appropriations. Um, another thing that he did was to help uh, with his stature, um, to help focus the spotlight on uh, the, the vulnerable and the disadvantaged and the, and the parts of our communities that really needed a champion. Uh, he held a variety of oversight hearings and, and brought in uh, peop Native people from around the country to testify uh, on their uh, environment and, and challenges with various federal agencies. He held uh, oversight hearings for Indian veterans to better understand the challenges of returning veterans and uh, in, in terms of uh, seeking their health care. Um, he held hearings on the, improving the mental health for Indian children. He focused in on health professions and expanded the uh, opportunities for American Indians to join the health professional workforce in other areas in addition to physicians, but also opened it up for nurses and psychologists and other types of, um, of professional training. He, he uh, passed special legislation specifically around fetal alcohol syndrome and its impact in uh, American Indian communities. And he changed the way uh, our hospitals and clinics uh, were able to be constructed. Um, in his travels, he heard uh, many stories about communities that had certainly won their place uh, on a construction replacement priority list, only to sit there for the next 20 years waiting for um, their queue to, to rise to the top in the, in the slow appropriation process. And so he really uh, w opened that up so that um, there were a variety of uh, joint venture and small uh, facility construction opportunities that were made available for communities that were willing to try other paths. And as you heard uh, from uh, uh, this morning uh, uh, from uh, Julie Kitka, the, the work that uh, he did with Senator Stevens, uh, uh, Ted Stevens, uh, substantially changed the landscape in Alaska for health care. The um, support for um, expanding telehealth and the, and the regionalized medical centers and outpatient centers in Alaska really are a flagship worldwide. Uh, also, another uh, thing that should be noted is the work that he did with Senator, Senator Domenici for creating the National Indian Diabetes Initiative, which continues today. Um, my, probably my uh, personal um, Personal um, point I, I would really like to make also is just that is is with regard to the trust that he provided uh, to American Indian uh, health professionals and health and tribal leaders to uh, to really provide the guidance for the future for Indian health. As was mentioned, uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a, a national. Um, deliberation process uh, wherein the uh, expiring Indian Health Care Improvement Act would, there would be an effort to garner national consensus about what the next reauthorized uh, Indian Health Care Improvement Act should look like. It was an exhaustive process that went region to region seeking input and eventually uh, came up with a consensus um, bill that was about as big as a telephone book. and. Uh, Senator Inouye's, uh, as chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, uh, embraced that uh, bill in total, uh, didn't change a word, and uh, introduced that to reauthorize the Indian Health Care Improvement Act in 2000. As many of you know, it was not reauthorized immediately. Um, it went through another 10 years or so of, um, of various efforts to be reauthorized. Parts of it were uh, pulled out and jumped, uh, attached to other bills, and, and eventually each of those pieces uh, were enacted. And then finally, in, in uh, 2010, it was integrated within the Affordable Care Act and became permanent, uh, a permanent reauthorization of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. Senator Inouye was, uh, was uh, as was mentioned earlier, that was determined to make sure that American Indian people had a place at the table, and the same was true with Indian health. Uh, the fact that the Indian Health Care Improvement Act is a part of 
it has been permanently reauthorized and was a part of the Affordable Care Act is, is significant in, in the early 1990s when President Clinton was looking at the affordable or at health reform um, and it looked like uh, a, a bill was, was being introduced on the Hill. Uh, he worked with the White House to convene a uh, tribal elected officials, uh, a meeting with the First Lady to go through in detail the uh, challenges and opportunities for the Indian health delivery system under uh, her version or the, the, the um, White House version of their health reform bill. He was a powerful man and he was a powerful advocate. Um, he completely trusted the communities, um, the, the reservation, tribally based Alaska Native Village leaders, the urban Indian health um, leaders, trusted their insights and recommendations about what is best for Indian health. Um, I'd like to just share my reflection about uh, Senator uh, Inouye. I, I met him in 1987 when uh, Patricia Zell uh, brought him to, uh, uh, on his initial um, fact-finding, uh, listening tour into Indian country, and we were very honored to, to know that he was coming to uh, visit us at the Seattle Indian Health Board. And just to kind of create a little context, the Seattle Indian Health Board uh, throughout the 1980s, um, beginning with the 1980 elections and the, the uh, major turnover there and, and sort of a mandate for reduced domestic spending, uh, urban Indian health had been zeroed out at every appropriation year by the White House and, and also by the Senate. And it was really Sid Yates in the House that was held the line and, and kept urban Indian health funded uh, each of those years. When, um, when Senator Inouye came out in 1987 to visit the Seattle Indian Health Board, we were in a state of siege. We had created a committee to save the Seattle Indian Health Board, and we had uh, reached out to, to a uh, retired, the late uh, Senator uh, Warren Magnuson, who was the honorary chair of that committee. Um, Senator Inouye uh, toured our healthcare system, our, our healthcare clinics, our medical clinic and dental clinic, we took him to the uh, uh, inpatient uh, alcohol drug treatment facility that he, that he toured as well. Um, and then uh, it, we were able to get him uh, to, to dinner with Senator uh, Magnuson, and they enjoyed that, that time very much. But he made a commitment at that time, uh, in, in large part, I think, because of the story um, that uh, he, he, he was uh, moved by the, the fact that uh, the history of the urban Indian population and the role that the federal government played in its uh, effort to both simultaneously terminate federally recognized tribal status and relocate large numbers of um, Indian people from the reservation into urban areas, which was the policy in the 50s and 60s. And because of that significant role that the federal government played in creating these urban, uh, urban populations within major cities, um, saw the clear uh, role and responsibility for the federal government to provide uh, health care for American Indian people in these cities. Um, he made a, he, 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 he took this on as, as a, uh, as a t part of, as a tenant in, in his uh, view of what needs to be done in, in across Indian health, that it had to include urban Indian health uh, providers and urban Indian populations. And it really helped to underscore uh, the, um, the uh, I Indian Health System as, as what's referred to as the ITU, which was called the Indian Health Service Tribal and Urban Systems, and, and brought in uh, a, a sort of struggling stepchild to be a, a really full-fledged partner in the healthcare uh, delivery process. Um, Many of the cities that were impacted by the relocation program in the 1960s also were the major Indian health, uh, urban Indian health providers. They were in Seattle, Minneapolis, Chicago, Oklahoma City, um, the Bay Area, Denver. Um, and the urban Indian population suffered from many of the same health, uh, poor health status indicators as American Indians in other locations, but they did not have the infrastructure and the family infrastructure and the organizational infrastructure to respond to those needs. 
So he saw that and understood that. Um, and I think really it, the, the, the uh, opportunity to um, engage and, and uh, support a, a population that had been disenfranchised, I think, was an exciting opportunity for him. Um, so Senator Inouye is much loved across urban Indian health programs. I wanted to, um, I have some photos of some of the urban Indian uh, communities and that the majority of American Indian people in uh, the United States live um, off reservation and in urban Indian communities, but still maintain strong ties to their uh, tribal communities. His influence, uh, his powerful influence, um, the power of his influence, uh, I can't, it is reflected in these charts. Uh, this first, this, this chart and this chart, they're the same one. But the, I just moved the arrows so you can see before Senator Inouye joined the Senate committee uh, or became chairman of the Committee on Indian Affairs, you can see the erratic um, changes of that red line. This, is a, this chart shows the, um, the cumulative percentage increase of funding for um, the Indian Health Service in the blue line and the urban Indian health program in the red. And uh, before he became chairman, we were fighting for survival. Sometimes we'd get restored, sometimes we'd get cut, sometimes we'd get restored, sometimes we'd get cut. After he uh, uh, became chair and continued to, to uh, be an advocate for urban Indian health, we normalized, at least within the context of the Indian health, the larger Indian health budget, and, and, and have continued to do so. Um, some of, some of the lessons, I think, just uh, in, to wrap up, the, the lessons that I, I believe uh, from Senator in, in, Inouye's uh, life and legacy and what we can learn for going forward, I would say that um, he, like many of us, believed that health care is a fundamental right and requirement for people. It's not a privilege. It's not for the pr privileged only. Um, and another lesson is that the, a compassionate society will take care of those most in need and we will not ignore the suffering of our uh, brothers and sisters. A third uh, lesson, I think, is that the, in the United States must fulfill its trust responsibilities to provide truly quality health care to American Indian and Alaska Native people regardless of where they live. Um, the fourth is that we're st America is still uh, greatly in debt in that regard that this uh, prepaid health uh, plan is still not fully paid. And finally, uh, I think the most important lesson uh, is that American Indian people have the wisdom and the, and, the, and the traditional knowledge and cultural context to address their own major healthcare challenges today. Um, if given the respect and the opportunity um, that the, these indigenous uh, ways of uh, understanding health and wellness um, can, can address our challenges today. This is an important lesson, I think, for funders and policymakers, but even more so, I think it's an important lesson for all of us as um, uh, individual leaders or leaders of our families or our communities uh, or elected leaders that we believe this as well. And I think it's being proven uh, in um, with the, uh, for example, South Central Foundation, the work that they're doing uh, in the, the, with their uh, patient-centered care. Um, but it also can happen in small communities. Uh, Senator Inouye was a great student of history. And uh, whenever he would meet you, he'd want to know where you're from, your tribe. Uh, whenever I you know, reminded him I was from the Nez Perce tribe, he'd always ask me, are you related to Chief Joseph? And so I wanted to just close uh, with the Chief Joseph quote. Um, Chief Joseph said, I have heard talk and talk and nothing is done. Good works will not bring my people good health and stop them from dying. I am tired of talk that comes to nothing. And I think that that was a message uh, at that time for the government, but I think it's really a message for us today. So I want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, John.
Thank you, Joanne. So our second speaker is Hardy Spear, who's a lifelong advocate and leader of Pacific Islanders. Hardy comes to us from Hawaii, where he most recently served as 20 years as the executive director of the Native Hawaiian Health Board. Hardy's got an impressively diverse career, doing everything from serving as a lifeguard, supervisor to teaching, and from running nonprofits to leading governmental organizations. Having grown up in Oahu, Hardy is passionate about Hawaii and the Cook Islands. He went to college at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, but he must have decided that snow wasn't his cup of tea. So he returned to Hawaii to get his graduate degree at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Hardy credits much of his success to having excellent mentors throughout his life. And a little known fact about him is that he's also served as a football referee. But today, I get to be a referee, so Hardy, um, just fair warning, we're running a little bit short on, on time, so we'll... Uh, we'll make we'll, it quick. Perfect. Thank you. First, I need a okay, clicker. Sorry. Uh, aloha, wina la kako. Aloha, everybody. Um, I want to, again, as everyone here has said, thank the National Museum for the American Indian and Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and particularly Patricia Zell, for mm -hmm. an opportunity to come before you and make... Uh, uh, a little bit of a presentation. I, I do want to say how how wonderful it is to see so many, um, I don't want to say old friends, but so many friends uh, over the years uh, to to be here with you all today. It's a, it's a great honor. Mahalo. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, go through this rather quickly, uh, but I do want to uh, stay with tradition. Uh, Pinky's Prayer. Uh, you heard Myron Thompson. Uh, you heard Nainoa Thompson. Well, Nainoa's father, Myron Thompson, uh, <clears throat> nickname was Pinky. Uh, Myron would always open any sort of presentation here in Washington D.C. before the senator, uh, before Health and Human Service individuals, with this pule or, or uh, saying. So I'd like to, in in tradition just go ahead very briefly and repeat it, so bear with me. Let us call upon, <clears throat> call forth the supreme powers of our individual spiritual beliefs to join us. For those who have them, call for our Almakua, our guardian angels, to be with us today. And now reach inside of ourselves and touch the spirits of our family members and special friends who have assisted us to be the people we care want to share, and dare to achieve impossible dreams. Let us gather our spiritual beliefs and strengths so that we can aloha them, thank them for their continued encouragement, guidance, and protection as we proceed through life. Now for our supreme power's blessing upon this gathering, in the words of my mother, in her language of comfort, na ke akua e ho'opo mai ka'i o ko, aloha. Aloha Pumehana. Daniel K. Anoi, who was this individual who gave spirit to all of us today? Well, he was a student of McKinley High School in Honolulu, Hawaii. He graduated in the class of 1942, four months after the bombing on Pearl Harbor. His school year, his senior year, was cut short by two months because of that bombing. He was a member of the ROTC band, significant for reasons that we'll get back to later in this presentation. He was a member of the 442nd Combat Team, 100th Battalion. Picture of him here. We all know of his bravery during World War II, Congressional Medal of Honor winner. And of course, our senator, our senior senator from Hawaii name. Oh, excuse me. Getting old, you know. <laughs> okay. So what did he know? He knew that health and wellness form the basic foundation of life, as Joanne has already indicated, based on his World War II experiences, being wounded in the battlefield, two years recovery. He knew what it was like to be in a hospital. And he based his knowledge he knew uh, from Hawaiian traditional beliefs and concepts, as Nainoa indicated in the presentation, his mother was Hanai, adopted by a Hawaiian family for a number of years. So his mother never 
let him forget. He also knew Native Hawaiians are the indigenous peoples of the United States with strong beliefs and traditions. A, create a, a creation legend, or I should say, not a legend, a creative story, cosmology, the Kumulipo with its Kinolao and Lokahi. What, that, what those are, besides the creation story, is the relationship that we have as individuals, as families, as communities, to our environment and our spiritual beliefs, all in balance in concepts of traditional Hawaiian values. What were these values? Excuse me, can't keep up with my speed here. What were these values? Um, we've heard this morning about what those values were in Indian country. They're the same in Hawaiian. You know, these are really international or worldly values. We call them by different names, but we need to practice them. Sometimes the Western philosophy or the Western ideas get in the way of practicing these values that we all hold dear. Our relationship to the earth and all the things that grow upon it our relationship as men and women in a balanced society. In a traditional Hawaiian psyche, it's based on <clears throat> island living and voyaging. The ocean, as Nainoa indicated, the ocean was our roadmap. It was not something to be feared. Voyages of over 2,000 miles were a part of the everyday life of Native Hawaiians 500 years ago. So the ocean was something to be treasured, something to be um, cherished, and something to be utilized in the daily lives of our ancestors. We came from a nation. It's interesting here when you talk about the Aupuni. Um, the Aupuni is the nation. Uh, this is the, these are the traditional islands that made up the kingdom of Hawaii. It's interesting to see that some of these islands are not part of the state of Hawaii. And for reasons that <clears throat> um, sometimes are a little bit unclear, but um, need further study. Hawaii was a nation, an independent nation, with chiefs who became kings and queens. Yet, Hawaiians have always been part of the U.S. fabric. We've defended the United States in its times of need. The photograph up on your left is of um, Prince George, or George Prince, Kaumualii. He and his fellow three or four Hawaiians that were on the East Coast when the War of 1812 broke out, enlisted in the Navy, fought on the Constitution against the Gruyere, and distinguished themselves very early in the journals of naval history. Many Hawaiians fought in the Civil War, some on both sides. There's the wonderful story of the Confederate raider Shenandoah, which went into the Pacific looking for whalers, took on a, whoops, took on a whaling vessel from the East Coast filled with Native Hawaiian sailors. They were given the option, join the Confederate Navy or we'll put you adrift in a lifeboat. They weren't stupid. They joined the Confederate Navy. Shenandoah, when the war was over, did not want to come back to the United States and surrender, went on to England where it offloaded its 15 Native Hawaiians who took over four or five years to get back home. But nevertheless, Hawaiians have played a major role in defending the United States from 19, 1812 through all the conflicts up to the present day Afghanistan. Hawaiians have traveled the world. They've also been part of the fabric of the West 
Senator Inouye took great pride and joy in telling his compatriot senators from Oklahoma and Texas that the first cowboys in the United States were Hawaiians. Yeah. Um, trained by vaqueros, brought to Hawaii in the 1790s by Kamehameha I, who found his lands being overrun by cattle, which were gifts from British naval officers, um, uh, which became uh, darn right ornery. So he asked for help from Mexico. Vaqueros came up to Hawaii and trained Hawaiians to be cowboys. But the stories of those early years go back uh, in terms of rodeo competition, et cetera, et cetera, Hawaiians taking first place many times. But there have been many challenges. Here you see, in terms of the Hawaiian population, pre-arrival um, of Captain Cook, estimated to be around 800,000 at the time of the turn of the uh, 20th century, 1900, dwindled down to 38,000. This was due to disease. A couple of eyewitness accounts. The majority of children born in the islands die before they are two years old, 1838. 1887, year by year, Native Hawaiian footprints will grow more and more dim along the sands of their reef-sheltered shores, and fainter and fainter will come their simple songs from the shadows of the palms, until finally their voices will be heard no more forever. That was spoken by our King David Kalakaua in 1887. Besides diseases, you had changing religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs, which <clears throat> led to a number of, of battles internally in our islands among the chiefs. You had cultural re repression um, brought by different values, primarily um, from the missionary side. And the loss of political governance. Here you see the palace guard surrendering to forces uh, of the American business elite in, in 1893. I believe the picture on the left has already been shown, but our queen, at the time of that abdication, indicated that in terms of knowledge and action, it is the width of a blade of peligrass. To gain the knowledge of heaven is to hear what is not said, to see what cannot be seen, and to know the unknowable. Actually, that was Senator Noy. 19th century eyes tell the story. If you look at the eyes of people lived at that time, you'll see that sadness that's reflected from all of these issues and concerns. Yet, the senator knew Hawaiian leadership was strong, from monarchs to the present day. This is some of the leaders in Hawaii. Some you may recognize, some you have heard from today. And so our senator's <clears throat> legacy of Ola is about people. I do want to say that the Hawaiian word ola is often translated as health, but it also it translated as life. Health is life in the Hawaiian context. Here you see the senator with, again, Myron Thompson. This is Nainoa's father. Uh, Mr. Thompson was not only a fierce advocate for Native Hawaiian education, as you heard um, uh, DJ Mailer speak, but he also was a fierce advocate for Native Hawaiian health. And in health, the story begins with Alulike and the formation of uh, the first uh, fairly recent uh, Native Hawaiian corporation. 
And the first document they did was a needs assessment that identified critical needs in the Hawaiian community. The next chapter was the Aolamao Health Study, which put together the first baseline study of Native Hawaiian health. This was followed by a congressional report done by Dr. Larry Miiki that identified Native Hawaiian health and compared it to other, um, other communities of color in the United States, which led to the Native Hawaiian Health Care Improvement Act passed in, 18, in 1988. I want to call your attention to the um, policy statement there that Congress hereby declares that it is the policy of the United States in fulfillment of its special responsibilities and legal obligations to the indigenous people of Hawaii to raise the health status of Native Hawaiians to the highest possible level and to provide existing Native Hawaiian health care programs with all the resources necessary. Now that second part is a challenge, an ongoing challenge we all have. But I need to commend and thank our um, American Indian, Alaska Native brothers and sisters for their support in the reauthorization of this act. It occurs in the Indian Health Care Improvement Act and the Affordable Care Act. It reflects the voices of Hawaiians people through the various testimonies that were held and studies that were done, again, at the senator's bequest. This, again, is a written legacy to the senator's work and the various statute authorities that are provided to Native Hawaiians. So we have an, a generation of, of accomplishments over the last uh, 30 years. If you look at where we were 30 years ago in health, we had no Native Hawaiian psychologists, we had no Native Hawaiian specific programs, and if you look at it now, the top of this, we have an, over 185 health professionals, we have health clinics and health services, we have a Native Hawaiian health scholarship program, Going through this real quickly, so excuse me. We have a growing population, supporting national organizations, uh, National um, Association of Native uh, Hawaiian Civic Clubs. Hawaiian language is the most um, popular course in our universities. We support our schools with Hawaiian legacies, ali'i legacies. You heard from Dr. Miller today from Kamehameha. We have over 400 hula halau scattered throughout the world. And we have our own Native Hawaiian healthcare system. But our future is yet to be seen and is critical for us. We need to protect our values. We need to continue to build on the foundation that the senator gave us. We need to reinforce that olelo noi ao that you see up there. Though the kalo has passed on, it lives in its shoots and its offspring. All of us are that living testimony to the senator. Which leads me to the last slide. You see where we are today in the eyes of the 21st century children. So we've moved from that 19th century to where we are today. Just a brief mahalo to all of Senator Noy's staff that have worked so hard and tirelessly for all our benefit. We have a final tribute. As, as I said, the Senator, um, was a musician. And when he lost his arm, not only did he regret the fact that he wouldn't be a surgeon, but he regretted the fact that he couldn't play the piano. And so he worked tirelessly to learn a tune on the piano. 
So we're going to do a tune that he learned for that. Oh, okay. So we've got to wrap it up. <laughs> so I've been told we have to wrap it up and we have to get ready to, to leave the facility. So at the reception, we'll play the tune for the Senate. Please join me in thanking uh, Joanne and Hardy.